And I'm so pleased that I, here at the Rosa Parks Museum, am the first one to give her a lecture and a book signing, to bring her home. Uh, a young scholar. And I'm hoping that some more young people are going to come in, because it's very important to realize that young people are writing. They're writing scholarly material, intellectual material, and taking that which we've looked at for years and presenting us to, into a whole new light. I thank you so much for coming. At this time, I'm going to bring um, Dr. John Smith, who is the Associate Professor of um, English at Mount Valley University, who co-authors the uh, New Southern Writers series with uh, Riche for um, the University of Georgia Press. I want to start with a little story to illustrate the importance of Dr. Richardson's work. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had gotten the mail a copy of a book called American Cultural Studies. And when I see those things, I always sort of look to see what's being said about the South. And they had one chapter on regionalism, and it had two case studies. And the first case study was called uh, Rethinking the American West, and that's fine. They've been doing that since about 1985, and that's appropriate. The next one was called The South. Beyond comprehension? <laughs> um, I hope none of us in the room feels beyond comprehension uh, at this point. Um, the idea that the, Brit the, the book was co-edited by a couple of uh, blokes at the University of Derby in England. And the idea that the British, of all people, might have difficulty comprehending a hierarchical, conservative, and historically racist culture is almost funny. But this strategy of, protect, of pretending the South is some incomprehensible exception um, uh, has served many groups well. It's allowed white non-Southerners sometimes to imagine a number of social problems as regional rather than national ones. And it's allowed uh, some black non-Southerners sometimes to position themselves as the urbane, sophisticated complement to their allegedly more Bama brothers and sisters. Dr. Richardson's work disrupts these and many other self-satisfied narratives that marginalize black and Southern identities, especially black Southern masculinities, the subject of her talk this evening. Though many of you know her much better than I do, I do want to share with you uh, how we met. Uh, I used to work as the managing editor of a scholarly journal, the Mississippi Quarterly, and part of my job was to go to the very best academic conferences and try to locate the very best work on the South and try to persuade those folks to publish with our journal. Um, I happened to go to a panel at the Modern Language Association uh, conference uh, around 2000 or so, um, featuring three, two scholars whom I knew, one Catherine Henninger at LSU, who's brilliant, one Bill Andrews, uh, who teaches at the University of North Carolina, who's probably one of the most famous African-Americanists in the world, and uh, someone I didn't know, some Rache Richardson, uh, who blew them both out of the water. Uh, I, I did manage to persuade her to, to, uh, to publish with us. I was more charming then. Um, and and uh, since then, she's been active in every major movement in the so-called New Southern Study. She was a, a big force at the 2002 Puerto Vallarta Conference, at the 2004 conference in uh, Oxford, Mississippi. She directed the program for the 2006 Society for the Study of Southern Literature conference right up here in Birmingham. Uh, she's published in every major journal worth, worth talking about. And uh, in 2005, the University of Georgia Press asked her to co-edit the New Southern Studies uh, series. Uh, and now her book is the second book in that series. And uh, it's just been an honor to know her for the past six or seven years. And I bring you, Dr. Rache Richardson. Thank you so, so much, John, for that wonderful and very generous introduction. And um, thanks just for coming. It is such a pleasure to see you here in um, my home. We are presenting at conferences all over the place, and so it's always good to come home. My heartfelt thanks go out to Mr. Jet Norman, who has supported me so faithfully over the years as an artist and also has given such generous support to my intellectual work. I want to thank the administration faculty and staff 
at Troy University for um, their role in organizing this event and helping to bring me here. I want to thank my family, friends, and community, all of whom have come out this evening, and um, give a tribute to my grandmother who's now recovering from um, an injury that she sustained last week. And, um, so my, my thoughts and prayers are very much with her at this point. I want to begin by saying that in my research, I focused on two main issues over the years, the status of the U.S. South in shaping discourses of race in the United States, and the status of the United States, in the status of the U.S. South in shaping categories such as the African American and the American. So that has really been the central focus um, that has energized much of what I've done at the level of research. And so the book is the major centerpiece of that intellectual itinerary, but it has unfolded over the years in, in various other manifestations. And now as we in Southern Studies increasingly think about and analyze the global South my work has also gone in some of those directions in terms of formulating research questions. But those two that I mentioned initially are the ones that are very much um, the grounding for um, a range of projects that I have formulated and certainly are the grounding for the book at hand. I was born and raised in Montgomery, and so I must say that the foundations for the project as it has come together are in some ways um, very personal, or it, at least it started out as a very personal kind of thing initially. Um, if I can summarize what put me on the road to such a project, I, I can go um, a long way back, but I um, will only go so far this evening and so I'll say just that when I first arrived at Spelman College as an undergraduate in 1989, one thing that I found very fascinating was that people were very obsessed with place. And one thing that students liked to do with me because they said that I didn't have a southern accent was to do what I called playing a guess where she's from game. And so my new friends, typically people from the Midwest in groups of other people, would do this thing where they would have um, me speak and then have the people guess my um, region, so to speak. And people usually you know, made Northeastern guesses, and then they had the pleasure of shocking them with the knowledge that, well, no, she's from Montgomery, Alabama. Can you believe that? And so that was really a shocking thing to see that there were people who found the idea, really, of the South as, as something of an oddity. And in that context, even, a lot of times, um, banal was thrown around as a slang word for everything that was tacky, for everything that was out of fashion. And as a person born and raised in Alabama, I always found those moments very offensive when people would say something like, maybe see someone wearing a very tacky outfit and say, well, that's so Bama. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> you know, and, and, and really didn't have the, um, I would say, the, the, um, the vocabulary to name the problem, but I definitely saw that there was a problem in terms of how people were thinking about the South. And then there were a range of other things that um, I think shaped this sense of Southern otherness when I was in, in college. I mean, students were shocked that I, for instance, as a person coming from um, a place like Montgomery, had straight A's in freshman composition, or that I knew so much about black history, when the truth was that I had attended a high school that really stressed um, black history. So the idea that um, someone who, say, wasn't from the North knew more than Northerners themselves about black history was just off-putting in, in, in certain contexts. And then there's that classic moment that I had with a friend around senior year, where she had gone to um, a choir. She was on tour with a choir and went through um, some parts of the South. And she said that on a Saturday afternoon, she saw these children standing on a corner in a country town. And she um, came back and told me that, well, I, I just looked at them and imagined that that was how you grew up with Brashe. 
And again, you know, I was just very perplexed that there was this stereotype of southernness as inherently rural, lodged so, so um, deeply in, in her mind. And in general, um, the Atlanta University Center, and then Spelman more specifically, was very much energized by urban cultures, even as the school itself or the schools themselves, taken together, were in the South, but DC set it all so that house music was the, the, was the music that dominated on campus. It was the only music that people tended to be interested in hearing. And so you had this fixation on the urban when, in fact, we were in a, in a Southern context. And so all of those paradoxes, I think, planted very important seeds early on for me for the formulation of a project like this on down the road. And I was able to draw conclusions such as um, those related to how people oftentimes don't see the South as a viable site for um, the production of popular culture. They don't see the South as um, an authentic site of blackness. They identified with a range of stereotypes about intelligence. So I knew those things, um, I think, in a very faint way by the time I graduated from high school, but really was very convinced of all of those, um, those impressions by the time that I left college and went on to graduate school. In college, I tended to find my comfort zone among um, the girls from New Orleans, it was interesting. I think that I could relate to them best in a way because they'd also gone to Catholic schools and had been debutantes growing up. Um, but a context that stressed uh, black nationalism on the one hand and feminism on the other tended to devalue things um, southern without necessarily even meaning to devalue those things, but just somehow did. And then when I was in graduate school, I was able to make a range of observations. Uh, that I think um, set important foundations for the, the project um, that has become my book. Um, most notably, thinking about Spike Lee's film work and his representations of the South um, was something that was, was very um, striking to me. For instance, um, I, I recognize that in a film like School Days, there's that scene in the Kentucky Fried Chicken parking lot where you have a confrontation between the characters Dap and then the leader of the group, the fellas, where um, Dap plays this kind of urban revolutionary who has, um, who's, who's portrayed as the, the quintessential um, black man, whereas the local, although he can drop some folk wisdom, ultimately he's not seen as someone who's very legitimate, in part because you know he has a jerry curl. But the way that, that a film like School Days ends up validating everything that is urban and devaluing what is Southern was just very noteworthy to me. And um, we can track this motif uh, through a range of Spike Lee's films, and I do so to a certain extent in this book. But perhaps the ultimate example that I encountered um, during the 1990s was um, One and Get on the Bus, in which the character Wendell Perry the only southern man on the bus is literally kicked off on the way to the William on the way to the Million Man March. He admits that he even has only attempted to go to the march because he's mainly interested in selling his cars as a result um, of his his greed instead of going for the motivation of of uplift and, and, and social struggle. So the way in which these southern characters tend to be discredited and devalued in uh, the work, say, of a film like, like Spike Lee, and the way that the urban, on the other hand, tends to be validated was something that struck me. And even later on down the road, once I um, finished graduate school and then um, it ended up in California, I saw the production of, um, of George Wolfe's Bring In The Noise, Bring In, bring in The Noise, Bring In The Fuck, correction. Um, for the first time in, in 1998, in San Francisco, and it was, you know, it was it was held, of course, as this kind of watershed production starring Savion Glover, as it um, was presented in New York at the Public Theater, and definitely is a wonderful, wonderful um, production, beautifully executed. But it, it really struck me that the the production is is organized by this 
narrative that begins in the South and then it becomes increasingly urban and then once it's urban you don't have any other Southern elements there and the urban is thought what is to be central to the definition of African American identity except for when we have this throwback scene uh, featuring a character called Uncle Huckabuck who dances with a rag doll reminiscent of Shirley Temple and so that kind of is, is a subtle way, I think, of alluding back to the South as a place. But overall, the production focuses on and validates the urban. And so I've, I've just been very troubled by the centrality of the urban in shaping authentic notions of blackness and this presentation of the South as a terrain of ideology. Of course, we have to understand what in some instances drives these representations in African American culture because the U.S. South on the one hand of course has long existed as a site of trauma for African Americans even as on the other hand it has also existed as a site of liberation and so there's a there's an inherent almost inherent ambivalence that many blacks feel when they think of the South as a region but we have to really increasingly think about the region in, um, in all its complexity so that, for instance, when we talk and think about the South, it's not necessarily as a, as a kind of ancestral site, which is commonplace in the African American context, but that we recognize it as a viable here and now in the shaping of African American identity. And so that is really one of the most important um, aims in my own work to to show um, that and then to show more generally how central geography has been in shaping um, black identity and a range of other identities. So with all of these questions in mind, of course, the challenge originally at Duke was how to frame and articulate such a project as this and um, how, to, um, how to present it in the form of an academic um, manuscript. Now, I did my graduate work at uh, a place that was very open to innovation. The Duke University English Department, as some of you all may know, um, gained a lot of acclaim for better and for worse, actually, in the 1990s as a place of critical um, and scholarly innovation. It was a department where people like Stanley Fish and Franklin Trickia and Eve Sedgwick and Kathy Davidson were front and center in terms of uh, setting intellectual agendas so that you even had a lot of features on the Duke English Department and mainstream publications like the, the New York Times. So coming into a department in the midst of all of that intellectual excitement and innovation, I think definitely made a profound impression on me as an intellectual. So that's, that's, that's one thing. And um, then Duke University Press uh, is also affiliated with the university and it um, has had just a salient role in publishing a lot of the innovative kind of scholarships so we could literally kind of get it hot off the press. And so there were all these wonderful watershed moments that I witnessed as, um, as a graduate student in that particular context. And when I came to the um, point of writing my dissertation, I, once I decided to write on the South, um, it, it became clear to me that what I was doing was, was not necessarily um, so much conventional uh, Southern literature as something entirely different. It was a project that um, dealt with textuality in a very broad sense So this idea, you know, when a lot of people think of text, they think of, of literature, like very literally, whereas um, cultural studies had become increasingly influential in the profession by that time, which endorses the exploration of just a range of texts so that you can conceivably look at song lyrics or um, you can look at um, poetry perhaps in a very different way, very innovative way. Uh, as Lauren Berlant has shown us, you can even read a t-shirt using the kinds of critical methodolo methodologies that we would generally apply to the reading of literature um, or film. So I definitely envision my project with more openness um, given that particular orientation. And I was working with a committee that encouraged me to be ex experimental in, in framing my ideas. And so 
beginning, I didn't quite know where I would end up going, but I, I very much um, began to walk by faith. What I tended to do was use a combination of Southern literature and Southern history, and, and then um, attempt to kind of frame a vocabulary for articulating all of the kinds of issues that were at stake for me as I developed the project. So in retrospect, I'm very thankful that my committee uh, that gave me the room to sort of find my own equilibrium in um, studying the South. Um, to overview the project itself, what I want to um, begin by saying is that when we think a lot of times about Southern masculinity, Black Southern masculinity in particular, the type that comes to mind is that Booker T. Washingtonian type who um, of course is one of Alabama's own, and we think of um, that hardy, traditional, hard-working, uh, self-sacrificing, long-surviving example of what it means to be a black man in the South, someone who's very committed to family, someone who's very committed to community. And so this is really a very favorable kind of, uh, of representation of black masculinity in the South. So those favorable representations are important to me and I think that they play uh, a role definitely even in shaping public and, and popular discourses and I mentioned that briefly in the book. But they're not my main concern in, in the present study. I'm really more interested in looking at the more pejorative representations of black masculinity in the South. And this is one reason that I begin with the Uncle Tom stereotype, which became arguably the most salient stereotype of black masculinity in the 19th century. Now, those of you who are very familiar with literature and who have read uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's epic 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, will know that in that novel, we encounter a very upstanding, um, honest and even proud model of the character Uncle Tom. He's actually a very young and robust man, as many critics, uh, including my colleague Patricia A. Turner, uh, have pointed out. And so th that the um, novel itself advances a very strong critique of slavery, put it at odds, really, with um, um, Many Southerners in the antebellum period especially, those who were most invested in conserving the slave system. And so over time, in contexts such as minstrelsy and theater, uh, an image of Uncle Tom was propagated that had virtually nothing to do with the original image that um, Stowe presented in her novel, which is one reason that a lot of people you know, have this uh, image of the Uncle Tom as this shuffling kind of stoop man, when in reality, um, Stowe presents him quite differently. So that translation of the character that occurred in the 19th century is fascinating in and of itself. And that's something that you know many people have conceded. One thing that I do in this book is suggest that in that translation of Uncle Tom, we also need to recognize that the changes were fundamentally rooted in the body and sexuality because you get a very um, pronounced recasting of the body of the Uncle Tom. So that you know he goes from being this very robust man to being someone who's um, a, a kind of shuffling character. And so the way that the translation is grounded in the body is what I really highlight in the book. And then on the other hand, in terms of thinking representations of black masculinity in the 19th century, I zone in on the black rapist myth, which as, um, as we know, emerged in the post-emancipation period, the period after slavery ended in the 19th century. And the black rapist is um, a kind of mythology of black masculinity that um, was universalized over time, but definitely had pronounced origins in the South. And one thing that it served as was a rationale for lynching. The idea, you know, that if somehow these these men are are, um, are, are violent, if they're criminal in that way, then they need to be disciplined or, and are even worth the most um, base um, annihilation. And, and so this image of a black rapist as it animated the, 
the, um, the Southern imaginary is something that I highlight as yet another very important um, representation of black masculinity that emerged in the late 19th century. And more broadly, of course, we can think of this uh, black rapist myth as something that was a clear reaction to the project of reconstruction um, among African Americans, a project that had as its goal the improvement of not really only African Americans, but a range of people who had been displaced as a result of the, the Civil War. And um, so when a lot of, you know, there are so many conflicting views of the Reconstruction. It's really probably been one of the most controversial periods in all of American, all of American history and one of the most hotly debated periods in American history. It's really one of my favorite periods to think about and talk about. Um, but, you know, for a long time, especially in historical scholarship, there was a narrative of the Reconstruction as a period that was um, very tragic in Southern history, a period when the South was dispossessed and basically placed under the heel of incompetent Negroes, under Negro rule, people who were largely um, not intelligent and very incapable of being leaders and so what does it mean to enfranchise or to give the vote to a population that you know has just one foot out of slavery and so um, historians um, well I think literary um, people played a, a very salient role in creating this more ideological view of the Reconstruction beginning in the late 19th century, but even um, historians by the early 20th century have begun to play a very central role in producing this more reactionary uh, view of the Reconstruction um, in, in, in the United States. But the bottom line for me in terms of pairing the Uncle Tom and the black rapist as stereotypes to examine is that both really were invested in this view of black masculinity as pathological. Now one, the Uncle Tom was an asexual kind of image of black masculinity and the black rapist was a highly sexed, uh, you know, almost even or really bestial model of black masculinity. And though they were op on the opposite poles, they, they served really a very similar ideological purpose in terms of, of propagating this pathological view of black masculinity in the late 19th century that was also centrally um, founded, I would say, in the US South. And I go further even by suggesting that in order to further understand this degenerate view of that black masculinity that emerged back then, we have to put it in the largest context and think about the role that science played. You know, science was kind of a glamour discipline in the 19th century owing to the authority, the cultural authority that had been established in a work such as Charles um, Dar Darwin's On the Origin of Species. And within this, um, Within this logic, um, you had this sense of a great chain of being, a, a kind of hierarchy of humanity in which blackness had tended to be positioned solidly at the bottom. And of course, this kind of extended um, perceptions that had also emerged during the Enlightenment when blackness was really framed um, primarily because of slavery as fundamentally inferior, as abject, as not even human in certain instances. And so coming from the late 18th century to the late 19th century, we had this strong ideological economy that tended to represent blackness in a very disparaging way. So science, in and of itself, had that point of view. And I think it is a compelling backdrop to think about in, in relation to these impressions of black masculinity that began to emerge in the, in the late South. And so, I mean, in the South in the late 19th century. And What's interesting to me too is that these are representations that over time were nationalized. So even if they had their roots in the South, they ultimately had implications for black men everywhere. So that, you know, when the Uncle Tom, for instance, is invoked nowadays, you don't necessarily think of a, a Southern man. You think of anybody who you would identify as accommodationist or a sellout or all those kinds of egregious things that we would tend to associate with someone like. I mean, who, who um, exemplifies the behaviors and values of Uncle Tom. And similarly, the, the black rapist stereotype plays out, or can conceivably play out, all over the land. The example that I use specifically in this book to kind of introduce the efficacy of a concept for the present era is that of Charles Stewart, who in 1989, the very year I graduated from high school, 
um, accused a black man of having raped his, or um, I mean, murdered his pregnant wife in Boston and was discovered to have been the um, culprit himself. But so you have had this kind of nationalization of, of representations of, of black masculinity that have had Southern specificity, but they've undergone na uh, nationalization. And so that's one reason that I argue that when we think about black masculinity, we almost have to think about the South. That's definitely not the tendency in studies, uh, like academic studies and dialogues about black masculinity. What tends to happen is that people tend to treat black masculinity as kind of one size fits all category. And they also tend to uh, think of black men as primarily an urban kind of category. But in my project, I say no. The South is even where we have to begin in order to understand these larger cultural dynamics that we would think of when we think of, of black men in the United States. So it, it to me, is, is just egregiously um, irresponsible to leave the, the South out of dialogues about a range of cultural issues in the African American context, because in some cases, this is precisely where we need to begin to come to any true and complex understanding of the issues at hand. Now, of course, the, um, the and, and so what I argue overall in the book is that the U.S. South has served as a, as, a, um, as a kind of framework and ground floor for the production of a range of stereotypes and ideologies about black masculinity that we can even discern throughout the 20th century. You know, the, the, the black rapist and the Uncle Tom are very early stereotypes of black men, we might say. But what I do in this project is trace is, is to trace the, um, the production of these um, representations, even over the 20th century, in a range of contexts, and that people are very unlikely to, to think about. The top example, of course, and the example that most of us know best in terms of how the black rapist has been given salience in um, American culture is D.W. Griffith's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, which is based on Thomas Dixon's 1905 novel, The Klansman. And in Birth of a Nation, we got the, um, the, a, a very conventional narrative of the South and Reconstruction and then also an embedded representation of, of black um, men as incompetent, as people who were rapists. You know, you have that infamous Gus Chase sequence of um, little sister who jumps off the cliff as he pursues her. Um, and, and this is um, a production that has had far-reaching effects, even in terms of shaping American film and um, shaping, even in its day, how many people viewed the history of the Civil War, war viewed the history of um, Reconstruction, and viewed blacks. And in its worst manifestations, of course, we know that Birth of a Nation even catalyzed violence and um, riots in places where it was released. So um, that is a, an important framing narrative for the book. What I do this is very different, though, with Birth of a Nation is that I, I relate um, William Bradford Huey's 1960 novel, 1967 novel, The Klansman, um, to this work in my analysis. Huey's mission and goal in writing The Klansman was to do something of, um, to do some civil rights activism to expose the, the horrors of the organization even in the civil rights era when many people thought that it was beginning to decline on, on some levels. And his, his larger goal was to offer a critique and even revision of Thomas Dixon's novel and D.W. Griffith's film. Uh, it's significant that Huey was born in Hartsell, Alabama, that um, he was very much a, a cultural worker rooted and grounded in the South. When I began to research this project, uh, you know, I, I, um, I was very open in terms of how I framed it. And um, I happened upon the video of the Klan from one day just while browsing in a video store, literally hanging out in Sacramento. And I looked and I saw, oh gosh, OJ starred in this film. OJ Simpson 
he starred in the 1974 film version of The Klansman. And so that, that moment was kind of what put me on the track to putting these texts together and to interpreting them in, in the way that, that I do in, in this book. Um, that article that John mentioned that um, I was reading at that conference actually had to, it was related to the, the Huey, um, the Huey film, The Klansman. And um, I developed the piece after I presented it at that conference and ultimately published it in the journal, the Mississippi Quarterly, for which John at the time was ser serving as managing editor. And it was just unthinkable to me that a man um, of, of such significance as William Bradford Huey, even though he had published 22 books in his lifetime, six of which had been made into films, had all but disappeared in cultural memory. That no one remembered this man who literally suffered cross burnings in his front yard and even you know, the endangerment of his family to stand up and fight for truths that he believed in. And yet at that point, um, his, his, his books were not really being taught. And so it was just important to me, even in that essay, to do something of a tribute to him. And it was an article that garnered the attention of Huey's wife, um, Martha Huey, which was totally a surprise to me. She wrote me an email after the article was published in the Mississippi Quarterly in 2002 and 2003 and told me that um, she was thankful that she had, um, had seen such a you know, such a tribute to her husband's work and legacy, such an affirmation of it. And since then, uh, thankfully, a lot more work is now um, being done on William Bradford Huey, but one of my own intentions and goals in this project was to definitely recover and give, um, give some salience to such a significant Alabama writer who um, is now, I think, um, just one of those people that we need to increasingly celebrate as we, you know, rethink the history of civil rights. You know, a lot of people had problems with his methods. He tended to engage in what people call checkbook journalism, where he would, you know, um, write um, sums of money for people who were allegedly assailants, like um, of, of of black victims, such as the. Um, Assailants, alleged assailants of Emmett Till or of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner in Mississippi and, and literally get stories from these people. And so some people thought that those methods were suspect, but um, it's just been very um, significant to me that Huey um, did what he did and was who he was. And so in, in that first chapter of the book, when I talk about the Klansman and, and think about his work, that's, on, that's foremost on my mind. Some people even identified him as one of the most prolific, if not the most prolific, Alabama writer. And so even for that reason alone, I think it's important to honor him. So in this first chapter, um, Birth of a Nation takes center stage. And I examine a kind of genealogy, we might say, extending from that, that, that highlights Huey and then also looks at the larger implications of this black rapist, um, black rapist stereotype and out how it is played out in a range of contexts and kind of go back to the O.J. Simpson case. I had, um, I, I, in graduate school, of course, the case was as interesting to me as it proved to be for the entire nation. And so incorporating some of the um, the, the kind of larger cultural analysis has also been done on, on that case um, has found its way into this into this study, um, or how ironic it is in some ways. It, I think the, the thinking about that chapter, the most ironic thing to me is that a lot of pins were wagging during the 1990s about the trial. People related it to the birth of a nation. They related it to Native Son. They related it to Uncle Tom's Cabin. They related it to everything but the actual film that O.J. starred in, in which he goes on a kind of killing spree, murdering clan members. So there's a kind of irony in the elision of that text in the very discourse in which O.J. is so centrally implicated. So one of my goals in that first chapter is to bring all of those strands together and to read them out to their most you know, logical and fecund extreme. So that's kind of... Um, what I attempt in the first chapter, even as I look at um, black liberation um, ideology, um, because there are so many parallels that people oftentimes draw between the re Reconstruction period and the period of black liberation in the 1960s. 
And, and so in, in that chapter, I'm really invested in considering how, um, like this, this fixation on the urban to me becomes most problematic, for instance, in, in that particular chapter in how we have something like an organization like the Lowndes County Freedom Organization which was founded, of course, in Lowndes, Alabama in 1966 for the purpose of encouraging black voting rights and civil rights. And it had a Black Panther as its sign. Um, uh, this is a fact that's not really well known now, though it's interesting, um, because the sign itself has gone, undergone a kind of urbanization over time, so that now when people think of the Black Panther sign, they tend to think of Oakland, California, and not Lowndes, Alabama. And so the way in which even aspects of black liberation discourse have been invested in the urban and contingent on this representation of southernness as fundamentally accommodationist is something that I'm very interested in examining um, in this chapter. The truth is that you know several of the organizations for African American self-defense were located in the South. You had the example, for instance, of the Deacons for Defense in North Carolina. You had the example of the Lowndes County Freedom Organization in Lowndes. But what happens in the black cultural imagination a lot of times is that urbanness is linked inherently to black insurgency and revolutionary possibilities. And so a character like the one that O.J. Simpson plays in the film, The Klansman attempts to disrupt that logic because he is a southern man in a fictive place called Atoka, Alabama. He witnesses the lynching of one of his friends um, by the Klan and then goes on a spree to avenge this. And so he, he fights back. But then, and, and so I think that that's a significant and even subversive representation of black men in the South. But then it kind of unsettles itself because it's also. Uh, the case that he's a character who's been very influenced by what's going on in the North. And so it's almost as if the film itself can't imagine Southerners being revolutionary on their own. And I guess my point is that we all know the history of civil rights. We all know, you know, the story. But how is it that all of these ahistorical impressions about what Southerness is circulates in the African American context? And so a chapter like that is really uh, meant to confront and to um, attempt to rectify some of those impressions and to show what is at stake in these ahistorical kinds of images of southernness. Um, as I go on, I'm, um, I'm continually committed to thinking about history in the manuscript. In chapter two, though, that takes another um, distinct manifestation. I deal with the military specifically and um, particularly zone in on this document called Disposal of the Colored Drafted Men, which was published in 1918 by um, a Colonel um, E.D. Anderson in the military after World War, or during World War I. But it was, a, it, was a, um, it was a document that suggested that it was better proportionately for the um, United States military to draft black northern men rather than black men in the south because southerners tended to be lower in intelligence and skill and they tended to have a lot of medical problems that would pre prevent their effective um, use as combatants you know in, in, in battle abroad and so the idea was that you know if the United States was facing these hardy uh, German troops then they needed to go to align with the best men they had. And Southern men in this document were categorized as the absolute worst. And so the idea was that it was most logical, most efficient to draft and, and train black Northern men, if any, and then to place the Southerners in labor battalions that were a step up from chain gangs, giving them work that was based continuously with the work that many of them already did as laborers, as everyday laborers in the South. And so you had a policy like this coming out from the US military and having arguably very far reaching effects even into World War II in terms of shaping a kind of hierarchy of black masculinity. And so I'm very concerned about how these kinds of um, impressions were um, established in the late 19th century in um, 
in, in these representations, such as the Uncle Tom and the Black Rapist, but then eventually even found their way, arguably, into American military policy, so that you have this kind of pathological view of a black southern male body um, produced within the military. And um, so that's the larger concern in that chapter, and I, it's specifically rooted in a reading of Charles Fuller's A Soldier's Play, that I think does a wonderful job overall of looking at hierarchies of black masculinity in which black southern masculinity tends to be devalued and black northern masculinity tends to be valued. In that, um, that play, it's first a play and then a, a movie, um, I imagine that more people have probably seen the movie than read the play. And it's, it's interesting to think about the you know, continuities and discontinuities in both productions. But Fuller, I think, is, is to be commended for the job that he does in terms of showing that if all African Americans are equal, in some instances, some are presented to be more equal than others. Um, the problem, and he does that particularly by showing the conflict that existed between Sergeant Vernon Waters and the character from Mississippi, C.J. Memphis, in, uh, in that play, where Waters eventually frames CJ for a crime he didn't commit, and CJ, a southern man who's talented and can play, play the blues and also baseball, becomes so disenchanted that he ultimately kills himself in the jail that Waters um, entombs him in, 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 in the play. So, you know, Fuller critiques all of this, but then he turns around and does this thing where he presents this urbane kind of hot shot attorney from the North who is presented as the only one who really has the intelligence to go head to head with this, um, this, this kind of racialized bureaucracy in the American military. And so it's, it's, there's a kind of paradox that drives that play. It's very interesting to me where it, in spite of itself and in spite of its best intentions, ultimately suggests that Northern black masculinity is the superior black masculinity. So but that's my, that's very much uh, my preoccupation in that particular section. And as I continue on, I, um, I become more precise in the anal analysis by looking at the rural specifically and how difference and otherness within the, in the category African-American African is produced in very specific ways in relation to people who are rural. So if Southerners are sometimes treated as alien and other um, on the basis of, of race and gender, when you add the rural, to the, to the mix, then it becomes even more complicated. You know, if Southerness itself is treated, is treated sometimes as something that's embarrassing or um, unsettling in the African American context, then people who are rural are oftentimes even more marginalized. Now, you know, we hear these kinds of racialist and very problematic um, epithets, you know, hillbillies, white trash, in the mainstream, they're racial epithets and they are also very rooted in the South, epithets that created hierarchies and class-based distinctions among whites um, in the antebellum era. And so when people, you know, throw the, a lot of, um, even celebrities think it's cool to kind of throw those terms around to describe themselves without understanding how offensive they are and understanding even how they function as, as, as epithets. Um, but, you know, these hierarchies and distinctions in the mainstream are familiar, or they tend to be more familiar, I would say, than the hierarchies and distinctions that are based on geography in the African American context. Um, a lot of people um, are more familiar, for instance, with the narratives that feature um, black rural southerners as, a, as romantic, so that you get this imaging of them as people who are the quintessence of black ancestry, history, um, spirituality, you know, when a lot of people think of those concepts, they think of the rural and have a very romantic view um, of all of those things. And so that's one impression of the rural, but the more pejorative um, sense of the rural and how it evokes shame is oftentimes not as acknowledged in the African American context, and that's one thing that I really throw into relief in this book. Um, in this um, chapter, chapter three, I begin by discussing the Tuskegee syphilis uh, experiment. As you may see, this is, this is a book that really has a lot of Alabama in it. It's not because I'm an Alabamian myself, that's a coincidence, I must say, but um, it just, it came together that way. But um, 
uh, the, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment kind of takes me further in advancing that through line of the book that looks at the way in which black male bodies are, 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 that are Southern are um, marked as pathological and treated as different as other and other, so that you get an experiment that was, you know, one of the, the most terrific things ever to happen in, in science and, and medicine. And yet it's still one thing that is often not said in discussions about this is that it happened in a way because of the fact that these were black men at one level, but also it happened because they were Southern. And you know, where they were, you know, in a rural context made all the difference in terms of establishing the very conditions of possibility for this horrific tragedy. And so linking this up with you know, how the military had, had kind of primed the context for this view of Southern masculinity as expendable, you know, don't let them go to war, put them on the chain gangs, and you know, just do something with them when we need to save every rag, bone, and tin can, is kind of what this, this report said. Um, you get a kind of heightening of that a decade, within even a, um, two decades, in the Tuskegee syphilis study and how it played out so horribly in Macon, Alabama. And so that's another historical moment for me um, that is important to develop as a node in terms of this, this tapestry that I treat. And more broadly, I'm interested in looking at Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and how it models this kind of alienation of rural black masculinity by the way that it treats, by the way that Ellison presents his character Jim Trueblood in that novel. Now, moving on, um, biography becomes central um, in chapter four, which um, mainly focuses, focuses on Spike Lee's films, but to come to that, I look at Malcolm X. Now, uh, some of you may be familiar with the controversy that um, centered on Bruce Perry's book when it was published in 1991, a biography of Malcolm X that argued that Malcolm X engaged in homosexual activities as a youth. And there's been a lot of academic dialogue, you know, did he or didn't he, and all those kinds of things, and you know, what does this mean for black masculinity? What does this mean for blackness in general? Well, one thing that I emphasize in my own study is that it really is, is not a very even viable strategy to focus so much on Malcolm X's life. I'm more interested in looking at the work, because the work itself, I think, gives us a kind of discourse on sexuality that we can talk about. And specifically, I'm interested in the speeches and the way in which Malcolm X made use of these Uncle Tom tropes so recurrently. And he tended to use this, what, you know, this dichotomy between the quote unquote house nigger and field nigger, in which the house negro represented the kind of, um, the, the accommodationist Uncle Tom type, and the field um, was identified with subversion. And in those epithets, what he often did was to use a lot of sexual invective, oftentimes to mark even members of the civil rights movement as people who were, were not as masculine as, say, the urban kind of man that he represented. And so it tended to present a very emasculated um, model of the civil rights establishment in the South. And so again, it's so fascinating to me that black liberation discourse, in spite of you know, all of this progressiveness at certain levels, it, um, it did a kind of violence on the basis of um, geography. And so Malcolm X's speeches are one context that I look at to look at, you know, to examine those politics. And then also even, um, it's, it's true of later autobiography of black liberation, like Huey P. Newton's autobiography, for instance, Revolutionary Suicide. Um, in this autobiography, Huey Newton admits that he was inspired by the LCFO in Niles County um, to create the Black Panther sign, or he had, had adopted it really from Lowndes. And so the fact that these people were organized, on, organizing on the basis of armed self-defense in the South, or at least not, if not so, you know, forthrightly, the idea that they indeed would defend themselves um, is significant. But, but but Newton admits this, and it's a, it's a well-known fact. And yet, and still, people tend to overlook the passages in his autobiography where he talks about his father, Walter Newton, as a very exceptional kind of Southern man. He says that his father wasn't as cowardly as most Southern men, that his father represented the exception rather than the rule because he would you know, talk back to white men in ways that most Southern men were not willing to do. And so the fact that 
that Newton himself was, we might say, a person who had this ambivalent view of the South. On the one hand, he used it and he recognized it as a, as a site that could help. But on the other hand, he conceded really in a way that it wasn't so, um, it wasn't the quintessential site of revolution. And so ultimately, the, the subversion that one might attach to um, a place like Lowndes gets buried. And for all kinds of reasons, of course, we might say that the Oakland Party eventually gained sole ownership of this sign. But what I want to suggest, or what it, I think is important to understand, is that these hierarchies and distinctions in the African American context have kind of played a crucial role in the way that that, um, that appropriation of the sign um, in urban context really was catalyzed. And then more broadly, again, that chapter treats Spike Lee and his obsession with the urban and these portraits of urban revolutionaries in ways that I've already acknowledged. The final chapter looks at Southern rap. And so it goes in a different direction. You know, it, it, cultural studies, um, as much as, um, and I even have some ambivalences about cultural studies as, as, a, as a kind of academic discourse, even as I've used it in, in my own work. But um, one thing that, again, it encourages us is to be open in terms of how we conceive textuality. And so when we look at literature, we can learn you know, certain things, but then we look at music, and it tends to be even produced by very different people, and so we can call up a range of other lessons from it that we might not necessarily learn from a work of literature. And so for that reason even, I think it's important to pluralize and democratize the range of texts treated in a book-length project such as this one. Um, for a long time, the East and West Coasts were the centers, the epicenters, really, of rap production. And the South was really excluded altogether as a viable site of rap production. You know, the, the impression almost was, who ever heard of a Southern rapper? And, and the, there was this kind of smugness as if, you know, well, the South doesn't have anything to do with rap, or it doesn't have anything useful to contribute. I remember even, you know, when I was in high school, I knew um, many talented people who um, could rap and was always perplexed wh about why people like them were never really featured in the media. And so we had this bi-coastal logic that was very dominant in rap that very much mirrored the kind of urban um, sense that has really been um, associated with popular culture, the idea that the only you know, important population, um, popular culture that can be produced is urban or that you have to be in an urban place in order to produce popular culture. And so what's been fascinating to witness really in more recent years is the shift from, the shift of, of the South from margin to center in rap, where a lot of people are you know, now proclaiming themselves to be from the dirty South or to be representing the South. This is a very new and different kind of thing in rap that we haven't seen and I think it's very subversive. And, um, it's important to recognize, even as I think we have to be concerned about the, the kinds of, um, all of the ways in which Southern rappers have reproduced and replicated the misogyny and violence of mainstream rap. But this shift, the sea change in, in rap that has occurred even since I began this project is something that I had to reckon with and, and think about. And so that's really very much the move in the final chapter of the book. And I'm specifically concerned about the production of rap in um, a range of cities or how this movement began under the heading of people like uh, Master P and um, Baby and Slim Williams, the Cash Money Millionaires, um, all of these, these major rap producers that really were very effective in putting Southern rap on the map. But what intrigues me, and, and I must say that there are just so many uh, of these artists nowadays, but I'm very fascinated by the ones who were some of the initial rappers, like when this, this um, first began, because now it's pop, like outcast, is, is, you know, is, they're really universal in terms of people who know them. Um, but in the early days, these rappers and some of their songs, I think, developed very provocative themes. And, and even specifically, there's one, Joe Black, from New Orleans, who wrote a rap entitled Way Down South, um, that came out on a 1995 CD entitled Bouncing and Swinging. And what it does, I think, and th this is very significant for my purposes, is that it argues that 
you know, black men in the South are portrayed in this very demeaning way in rap, or they're, you know, they're, they're thought to be people who ride on cows, spit tobacco, um, wear straw hats, people who are cowardly and that sort of thing. And so black in this rap calls himself um, confronting the men from the East Coast, the West Coast, and up North, and suggesting that black men down South were doing all the kinds of things that other rappers and other places were doing. And so that this conflict is staged in this song, to me, registers really the ideological economy that has existed about you know, masculinity in the South for, um, for decades. But to, to really bring it home to rap is what I attempt to do, even as I look at how these similar, con I mean, how similar conflicts have been um, played out in literature. Now, in terms of the larger implications for the project, I just want to conclude by highlighting um, some of those. The, um, the title of the book, Uncle Tom to Gangsta, is framed in such a way to suggest that there's really not that much distance between Uncle Tom and Gangsta. You know, a lot of uh, rappers nowadays are presenting themselves as gangsters and, and players. But what I want to contend in this, or what I do contend in this study, is that we got an impression of black masculinity as violent and criminal, really very solidly established in the cultural imagination. And when people um, frame themselves as gangsters, even in, in rap, what they do in effect is to recast these very historical <laughs> and very problematic ideologies of black masculinity. And so the Uncle Tom and the gangster in that sense to me function as two sides of the same coin. And so it's the kind of project that wants to make people think twice when they identify with the gangster model, because it's not that distant from other problematic ones. The other thing is that we need to recognize the way in which these impressions, again, grounded in the South, have oftentimes been nationalized of what we can learn from them. The best example that I think, or one of the best examples that the book offers is that of the convict leasing systems that were prevalent in the late 19th century South, and then you have the military setting up a kind of labor policy that, again, put black men to work in a very institutionalized way and circumscribe them rigidly. And so all of these moves, I want to suggest, early in Southern history, in some ways establish foundations for the way in which black men now are oftentimes um, circumscribed within the prison industrial complex so that they disproportionately represent the prison population, disproportionately are the ones incarcerated, disproportionately are the ones who are um, contained. And people, of course, like Angela Davis, have looked at the prison industrial complex with a lot of interest and called it a form of neo-slavery. But to look at the late 19th century South and the early 19th century, I mean, and the early 20th century South and see these connections kind of gives us some foundations for thinking a very natural. I am so pleased. If there are any questions or comments you have of her at this time, uh, feel free to um, come raise your hand and speak out. You're still trying to digest. I have one question. Uh, as you talked about uh, Spike Lee, has Spike Lee had the uh, privilege of your work? Um, not as yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure he'd like it very much. <laughs> but um, you know, I really do admire Spike Lee, and my hat's off to him as an artist for everything that he does. And I, I certainly have always followed his films with interest and, and great respect. But it's that motif, that kind of impression that his films give that urban masculinity is the most subversive is what I find problematic about them. To his credit, though, I must say that we get a very different kind of representation in Four Little Girls of the South. Mm -hmm. And still a very different kind of representation in um, his film about Katrina. So his artistry has definitely evolved in significant ways from even the earlier films that tended to present this impression. I'm happy to hear your comments about Uncle Tom. Uh, through the years, he's been a very misunderstood man and badly labeled, and people who really don't know his background see people who uh, are, they think are subservient, uh, 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 not the uh, uh, real masculine of uh, And they go, he's an Uncle Tom. But Uncle Tom was none of that. Uncle Tom was a courageous man who was never, they couldn't break him. 
and he's, he had the courage to stand up for what he believed in. And it's a shame that uh, uh, he has this label that's gone through the years, and, and, and people call people in Uncle Tom and don't know the meaning, really the meaning of Uncle Tom. And one of the examples uh, was my, my good friend, Louis Armstrong, who was often called an Uncle Tom. And he was a courageous man who did a lot of things uh, to further the race, and he made sacrifices uh, to fight discrimination and segregation that people don't ever talk about. But they see him wiping his face with their handkerchief and grinning and going on, and they, they have labeled him an Uncle Tom in many cases, where it's really a false label and a shame that the word has gotten out of control as far as the correctness of its use. Uh, another typical example uh, was, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Stephen Fetcher, and uh, he was very bitter because the world thought of him as an Uncle Tom. But he was a brilliant man who, in his work, used his personality to get work and, and to better his role. Uh, it's a shame that people don't know that he would grin and go on, and, but he did this to make his role his little bit past longer because they said he couldn't read and he couldn't write. So he found ways to, to, better, to limit his roles so he could make more money. And he was very bitter. He said, and I'm not like that. He says, uh, the, I, mean, I had a chance to talk to him. He said, I'm just playing a character. I'm playing a role. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a shame that people think that I'm not that and I'm not. Okay, so I, I was very happy to hear your comments about Uncle Tom. I think we have a question from a young man. touched on towards the end there um, the southern strategies and uh, that were in some way played a role in the policy formation in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. How do you expound on that in your book and to what angle are you coming from there? Okay. Well, what I'm interested in doing is, is well, when we, I don't know how many people are aware of the southern strategy. And of course, there will be different impressions of what this meant, what all of its um, ramifications have been. But um, this idea of, of um, in some ways, unsettling a lot of the gains of civil rights through in encouraging a, a kind of conservative posture, mainly in politics, is what has arguably developed <coughs> over the past several decades. With this culmination in a project like Newt Gingrich's 1994 contract with America, well, um, again, depending on point of view, some might argue that these had very devastating consequences for um, African Americans more generally. And I guess the paradox that I deal with in this, um, in this particular book, or where that comes in for me, is again, we have to look at how this policy began maybe in the South under the heading of people like um, our own George Wallace, um, but was ultimately nationalized under the heading, say, of someone like Newt Gingrich. And, and, and you know, designed to push voting, to push um, policy making in a certain direction that, um, as a byproduct, in certain ways, created despair for a range of minorities, including black men. 
And, and so you have, on the one hand, conservative policies that stresses healing in the African American context, encouraging um, marriage, for instance, in the African American context as a way to move beyond poverty and more responsible behavior. And these are important things, of course, to um, pursue. But there's an irony in it, as far as I'm concerned, to the extent that a lot of the same people who taught this talk are the very ones who turn around and vote for three strikes law, the kinds that are designed to take black men off the streets and incarcerate them in prisons. And so there's a, there's a kind of double standard that exists, or hypocrisy that exists, that I think it, it, it comes into the leash if we look closer at you know the roots and origins of this. One more question. <laughs> There's a paper that I'm developing for my colleagues at Ole Miss that actually focuses on the Hattie McDaniel character portrayed um, in Gone with the Wind, um, Mammy's Mules and Rules, in which I'm kind of looking at Scarlett O'Hara and how there was an irony in the fact that she tended to know the rules about the South, the old South and its values in a way better than the Southern elite. Well, there was a paradox in the fact that these black Southern servants were the ones, in some cases, in positions of power to teach the master class. But there's another question that I think is implied there that, that's important to at least think about. You know, why focus on black men as a topic or example when looking at the South? And the reason, the main reason and justification for me to do so in this work is that when we think about masculinity or when people think about racial authenticity, they so often think about masculinity of guarding masculinity and thinking about what that means as the scholar Philip Brian Harper has argued. So in that way, I think it becomes productive to isolate masculinity and see the way in which it, um, or impressions of masculinity are very central in shaping notions of blackness. And that has to do with you know, just the way that patriarchy has, has operated in, in, in some context. But in general, I think that you know, it definitely is is useful to you know look at um, just a range of gender models in terms of thinking about these problematics. My dissertation actually was more general in terms of looking at um, southern representation and what I call displacements of southerners from the African American context. And so it was um, only in terms of developing the book that I isolated black men to kind of trace the problem. And I think to disrupt some of the logic of the profession. I mean, there were so many scholars. Um, Male scholars actually doing work on uh, black women in the 1990s in graduate school, and you know here I am working on black men. So we have to kind of move these skills forward and dialogues forward in whatever ways we can. While we're moving Michelle to the table here for the signing, I just like to say remember her name because next summer you be you seeing her now as a scholar in the internet. Next summer, June, July, and August, you'll be able to meet her as. Riche, the artist, will be having an exhibit of her quilt in the exhibit hall. Um, I think, what's the title again? It's Portraits, right? What we name it? Portraits from Montgomery to Paris. Yes. I've seen several of them. We're still working on them. And you're in for quite a treat. You're actually going to see portraits on fabric in a way you've not seen them before. Okay? So uh, June, July, and August. Of 2008, you will meet Rache the artist. If you have your books and you want them signed, please hear and thank you so much for coming. I just say that my seventh grade teacher, Ms. Catherine Harris, is here. Oh my word! <laughs>